So today I'm going to talk about analytical object centrifugation. And we're going to think about the processes that molecules can go through for their lifetime. So we, we could have, um, say, like a protein that, that's going to fold and, and maybe bind onto something, or maybe it could aggregate or you know, it could crystallize. Or it could be involved in assembly here, you know, forming a nucleosome. So there's going to be big changes in shape, in mass, and solving interactions. And one way we can we can look at that is by using AUC or analytical ultracentrifugation. So, so it's a big challenge to be able to to look at things. Uh, you know, obviously it's a very very easy thing to do. You just spin things very very hard and then look at them. Um, but the the challenge is you've got to be able to um, look at it and you've got to then be able to uh, you know, look at the concentration be, um, and then be able to analyze the data. So when we do AUC, we, we, we put them into, into special rotors here and the force is then you know, maybe up to you know, 280,000 G. So that's about the, the force that a, a bullet coming out of a gun would actually undergo. So it all really starts uh, all the way back in the 1920s with Fia Swedberg. And he was he was working on, on on dispersed systems. He thought proteins were were colloids, and he built really the, the first analytical centrifugation. You can see in this museum here, and it's a huge thing. It takes up an, an entire room. But really, it was uh, protein AUC was really really started then um, by an experiment by his student uh, Ferreras, who had just taken some um, hemoglobin and decided, oh, let's try this and centrifuge, let's see if it, it, we, we can actually centrifuge it. Fuse it. And Swedberg thought, no, 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 it's not going to work. You know, it's a stupid experiment. And he went to bed halfway through the night. Then uh, the Ferres could actually begin to so saw that the, the hemoglobin was then beginning to uh, be spun down. It was, it, the red color was, was separated from the meniscus. So he phoned up. Swedberg and said, Fia, I see a dawn. And that was really uh, the start. So what, what maybe is, is also quite quite um, ironic in a way is that Swedberg thought that the proteins were, were colloids. And of course, more recently now, we're all thinking about phase separation and liquid-liquid phase separations and, and proteins in, in being in those kind of systems. So AUC has got a, uh, you know, was first developed in the 1920s and they looked at the molecular weight of proteins. Swedberg went on to look at protein subunits. Hydrodynamic theory was then uh, introduced in the 1930s and developed. And in the 1940s, then with the development of the Model E, um, then people started to look at the shape of proteins. And of course, we all know, um, you know, about, as, AUC because um, we all know about S numbers and this S is, is denoted as, as a Swedberg unit and it's talking about analytical centrifugation and of course you know the classical uh, you know, mechanism of, of replication of DNA with mental install um, was, was done with, with AUC and of course ribosomes we all know about the 30S and 50S. In the 1960s then there was a seminal paper by uh, Yathantis and you know the analysis was then developed into multi-components. Uh, it was really in the, in the 1970s then became the, the heyday of, of AUC because they could start to use computers to analyze the data. And, you know, coupled with then more theory from of, of, of hydrodynamics. In the 1980s then there was a bit of a crisis because this Model E was becoming obsolete. Um, there was a rebirth um, in the 1990s with Beckman then making the XLI proteome. 1920s, and Tom Lai made the fluorescence detection system, and there was a lot of computer software development by users to analyze the data. So what's the future? Well, in 2017, then Beckman made um, the Optima, a new um, centrifuge um, that's got faster scans, more wavelengths, and it's got a higher res camera. So let's go back and and think about well, why do we want to use AUC? Well, of course, you know you can if you've got something, you can spin it. So you know proteins, peptides, anything, as long as you can sediment it. 
um, why would you want to do it? Well, questions might be, you know, well, what's in the sample? You know, what's the mass? Can you tell me about the ship and size? A you know, question you could ask, we don't necessarily uh, get asked ever, would, would be, is there any sovereign interactions? You know, you can look at associations, binding, cooperativity, connects with binding. The, a, good, a good reason for using it is because it's in solution. There's usually no tags unless you're using the fluorescent system. You've got a fixed concentration. You know, you're starting off with, with on a sample, you're going to spin that. And you know, you can recover that sample at the end as long as it doesn't get back, you know, sucked out into the vacuum. So what's the, the kind of setup? Well, first of all, we need um, special rotors and these rotors have got a hole in them. So you can actually, you know, look through them all the way through, but they can hold then these cells um, into which then you're going to clamp this assembly where you've got a centerpiece, which will hold the sample and that's clamped between two windows. And you can get different types of centerpieces. You can either get a two centers centerpiece or a six centers centerpiece. And there's a variety of other very specialized ones as well. And the reason why you need two then sectors here um, is, is because you need a reference and a sample. So for an absorption detection system, then you've got a, a Senon flash lamp which is, is then going to be shown through then the sample. And then there's going to be a detector um, underneath then, and that's then going to be scanning across. So with a, a sample and a reference, then you can uh, look at the intensity of the light coming through. So if we imagine here, this is the, the inside of the rotor and this is going to the outside of the rotor. Then as we scan across, then we'll come across the air, a liquid inter interface for the reference, and then the liquid, um, liquid inter interface here in the sample. And you just use you know, the, the bare Lambert law to then get um, the concentration from the, the absorbents. In the system here, there's a, a very range, wide range of, of wavelengths you can, you can do. You can do up to three wavelengths at a time. Because you're, you're really scanning, then there's a finite time it takes to look at the sample um, on, each, on each run. Um, on the interference detection system, it's a slightly different setup. Um, we're going to shine um, a laser through both the, the sample and the reference. And th those then are then going to be combined um, in, through this lens system and then looked in uh, by a camera. An advantage here is that you're looking at right the way across the sample on, on each um, detection. And so what happens is, so you, you shine laser through uh, both the reference and the sample. Those, those, uh, uh, those light rays then get uh, recombined. And so if you're going through a sample here, you then, it's going to be a change in, in the refractive index. And so that might then mean that the light will, will be out of phase uh, compared to the reference. And so when they, those are recombined, you'll, you'll get destructive interference. And in other cases, it will, it'll come through and it'll just be in phase. And so when it, it com gets combined, then you get a bright phase here. And so that's what you see um, when you scan across. You see this, uh, you know, this, this whole array of dark and and bright areas. And the displacement of these fringes then depends upon the concentration, and which then depends upon the wavelength and also then the refractive index change. And that refractive index change then is then related to the concentration by um, the DMTC. And as you can remember from, from Chris's uh, light scattering, there is a kind of a universal uh, kind of figure for that DNTC for proteins. Um, which you know you can use, or alternatively, you can actually calculate um, this for your particular protein sample. For the fluorescence detection system, then there's a box that sits inside the, the centrifuge compartment, and it's a confocal arrangement. You've got um, a solid-state laser um, at 488, so which means it's it's good for detection of GFP or something like Alexa 488. 
and then that gets uh, you know, focused and then uh, deflected on by this mirror, then down to a point here um, in, you know, in the sample, then the fluorescence then goes through then the dichroic mirror and is then focused and then through this pinhole in this detector here. And this whole box then can scan you know, across the cell as it's spinning. So different detection methods, you know, what's the best one? Well, they've, they've both got their advantages and disadvantages. You know, the absorbance is, is very sensitive. You can choose the wavelength, but a disadvantage might be that you've got a, a finite scan time to, to really scan across. Of course, there's a limit if you've, if you've got something that's you know, very highly absorbent, um, then essentially there's no light coming through. And so it's, it's very difficult to, to detect. Um, and similarly, if you, if you go very, very low down, um, you know, you, you don't get very much of a difference, but you can, uh, with the xenon lamp, you can exploit, there's a, there's a lamp peak at 380, sorry, 230 nanometers, and you can get a bit more than sensitivity down to these kind of, you know, ranges here. Interference, then you can get a, a much higher range, um, especially with, with material that's got a low extinction coefficient. Because you're looking um, at a picture of the whole of the cell, then you know, the scan time is, is very, very short. You can you know, look at very, very uh, low samples, um, well, relatively low samples, and go up to high uh, concentrations, as long as then you, you kind of don't kind of reach this limit um, of 70 fringes. Um, but in those kind of cases, when you've got very, very high concentrations, you might start to get into non-ideality. So it's got um, excellent precision, and but you have to be very, very careful with, with the buffers, as, as we kind of talked about with the, um, during the, the biosensor talk with Biocore, where you've got you know, differences in buffers, then you've got differences in refractive indexes. And so that if you've got a difference in the refractive index between your sample and your reference, then you'll actually see that <coughs> in, in the result. Now with fluorescence, that's very sensitive. And again, scan time, you're gonna have to scan across. It's got a very, very large dynamic range, but of course you've got to have a sample that is, can, can be excited at 488. Um, a good, a good um, advantage is that you need quite small quantities. Right, so there's two types of experiment that we, we tend to do. One is either velocity, where you're gonna spin very, very fast and everything is going to then sediment down, or equilibrium, where you're gonna spin relatively slowly and so that the, the profile then won't actually change over time. So let's first of all look, look at uh, sedimentation velocity. So here's the meniscus, here's the bottom of the, of this, of this, of the cell, and obviously the outer of, this, of the centrifuge. So then when we start, we can see then, this is scanning across over different time scans. You can, can see then the profile then goes towards then the, the bottom. And, and we can see here that then there's, there's again, different species are then sedimenting at different rates here. And if we do a plot against time against radius, we can see that then really the, these are the kind of the changes that are actually happening. So we've got to be able to analyze this um, to be able to, um, to try and get an idea of the mass of, of, of the samples. So we're gonna just go through some, some you know, basic kind of theory. So you don't have to worry about the details, but just to kind of get the ideas of, of, of what the processes are actually happening. So first of all, let's, let's just imagine that we've got a, 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 a protein perhaps here, you know, in the middle of, of the cell here. And so it's going to undergo, undergo a centrifugal force. And that sedimentation force then is going to depend upon the mass of the protein, how fast uh, the rotor is spinning, and where exactly this, this component is, you know, relative um, to the radius of, of the centrifuge. But of course, this is, this is going to be then opposed by, uh, by let's turn buoyancy because you've got to move solvent um, away from, from the sample as it, as it kind of goes down through here. And there'll also be friction as well. 
And if you can imagine that, if you can even remember what it's like to be in, in a crowded room, maybe, you know, a dance floor where you're trying to push your way to the front of, of, of a gig. And you imagine that you've, you know, you've, you're going to, going to push through, but you know, people have got to go you know, past you and, and behind you. So this is this kind of idea of, of buoyancy. And this buoyancy will depend upon the mass of the solvent that's displaced. And then there's also going to be a frictional component as well. And that's going to be dependent on the velocity of the particle. Okay, so it's it's velocity uh, sedimentation, so it's obviously velocity. So uh, you know, there's no acceleration. The particles are then moving at a, at a constant speed. So therefore, all the forces must balance. So let's just put the, the components in there, and let's take the mass the mass terms together and rearrange a bit. And now this mass of solvent is then dependent upon what the mass of the, the, the protein or particle is times the density times this term called V bar. And that's called the partial specific volume of the protein. And if you again remember back to, to Chris's light scattering uh, lecture, go back and have a look at it on YouTube, then when he talked about uh, when Peter Schock had looked at the whole range of of protein DNDCs, so that was on the on the x-axis and the y-axis, then was this term V bar, and for the majority of proteins, then they lie within this kind of range of 0.72 to 0.74 mils per gram. For DNA, that's slightly different. Okay, so we can substitute that into the masses, and then we get this term here. This is the mass of the particle, dependent then upon on this term here. So let's just rearrange to get the, the mass of one side and we can then see then this is the, 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 uh, the velocity against the angular speed of the rotor against where it is in, in the uh, radius and that's massive with the friction. So the sedimentation uh, coefficient then is really dependent upon how fast uh, a, a particle then moves through the sedimentation field. And the unit is, is Svedbergs, and where one Svedberg is equal to one by 10 to the minus three seconds. And it's important to remember that, you know, normally we'll talk through all this about kind of positive values of, of sedimentation, but it could be negative as well, because you could get flotation. Um, so let's think about this friction. So what's this friction dependent upon? Well, it's going to be dependent upon the diffusion of the, of the particle back. And then it also depends upon the radius, we have called the Stokes radius and the sediment and then the, the viscosity of the sample. Now for something like BSA, um, where it's got a, an S value of about 4.3, it sediments at, at, at this rate when you, when you send it at this speed. And so we'll experience a very small frictional force of, of 0.05 in you know, femtonewtons. It's very, very small, but it's still very, very important. So we usually um, kind of talk about frictional um, coefficients in, in relative to um, a sphere of the same mass and density called R0. And for typical for proteins, then the frictional coefficient um, relative is about between 1.2 to 1.5. So this frictional coefficient can tell us about the shape and the asymmetry of, of particles. Something that's going to be, you know, much more extended is then going to have a higher frictional coefficient. And we'll come back to that with some of the examples um, later. Okay, so let's let's take this frictional coefficient, let's substitute it in to our equation here. And let's make it into molar terms in, in relative to the Avogadro's uh, number. And so we substitute it in and we get down then to what's called the Svedberg equation. And that essentially then relates this, this speed here is then just related to the mass against the diffusion. But how do we then uh, solve that for you know, a sedimentation profile where the concentration is changing all the way you know, through uh, the sample here and it's changing with time as well. So again, we've got to do a bit more, bit more maths. 
But again, just, just think about the, the, the principles. So a way to tackle this mathematically would be to think about fluxes. So we, we've got to have, you know, a particle flux is, is going this way in terms of sedimentation. And, and again, so that's the sedimentation flux, it's dependent upon the concentration and the speed. And then that's going to be opposed then by the diffusion here. And of course, that diffusion is going to be depend upon you know, the concentration of the radius. And again, because you know the removing of constant speed, then you know the flux at a, at a point is, is then going to be depend upon these two opposing forces here: the sedimentation flux minus the diffusion flux. So let's let's put those values into this equation here. And let's let's just do a bit of uh, a bit of thinking. What we're we're trying to look at. Well, what we're trying to look at then is is the change in concentration with radius, um, which is going to be equal to again this one here. So it's the rate of change of flux with, with radius. So if we can substitute in then these values here, then we get this equation here, which is called the Lamb equation. And Okay, it's, it's a nice equation, but unfortunately, there's no, no further maths we can actually then do to get an analytical solution. So what, what people have done is then is, is really use numerical and then analytical methods um, to be able to then, you know, look at the constant, look at how these kind of uh, boundaries then shift with time. And to be able to then, you know, find out what the sedimentation coefficient is and what the diffusion coefficient is. So that's just by, by number crunching, by say, um, you know, doing simulations and then comparing that against the data. But effectively, what you're, what, what it's really looking at then is it's looking at the same, in terms of the sedimentation coefficient. Then it's looking at the speed of how this boundary you know, changes over time, while the diffusion really is then going to be related to how this, this boundary then spreads. So we do a new, you know, put it into, into the computer and then hopefully then we'll, we'll then get a sedimentation coefficient and we'll give us information about size and shape. Now for equilibrium, it's, it's a bit easier to, to understand, um, but again, we're gonna use the same uh, principles in terms of, of fluxes. So again, you know, we're doing it very, very slow. So what then happens is that, you know, the sedimentation is gonna be then, is then gonna be opposed by, by diffusion. And so after a certain, a certain time you reach an equilibrium where these two fluxes are equal, and then you'll just get a constant concentration profile down the, uh, the radius here. And there's gonna be no further movement of this boundary because you're at equilibrium. So here from before then, we, we've got the, the, the two different fluxes of sedimentation and diffusion. Equilibrium must be equal to each other. And, you know, therefore, you take one away from the other, it must be zero um, at any kind of point in, in the radius. And then let's, let's again just do some rearrangements here. And so one over C, DC over R, DR, well, we can, we can say that, well, D lin, uh, of, uh, sorry, of D lin C over DC is equal to one over C. If you can think about integration backwards. Um, so we substitute that in and let's integrate. And then we're just gonna get then an equation, which is really the concentration at some point in, in the radius is gonna be equal to the concentration uh, at the start and it's gonna be an exponential term really then to the diffusion against the, the speed and sedimentation coefficient. And then, you know, the relative position uh, at the radius compared to the initial. So from, if we then substitute in the Swedberg equation into this to get rid of the diffusion term, we then end up with an equation then, which is then gonna be related where this exponential is then just dependent upon the mass of the protein and the speed. So there's then no information about the shape. There's no frictional coefficient in there at all. So it's shape independent. Of course, 
you know, if we think about hydrodynamics, it's not necessarily so simple. Um, you know, so far we've kind of just been thinking of this kind of dry particle kind of, you know, going through a solution, but of course, you know, particles aren't dry. There's going to be, you know, solvent attached to, to uh, a sediment and particle. Um, so, you know, we think about the buoyant masses then just then related to the partial specific um, volume you know, times the density. But actually, you know, the particle isn't dry. And, and so there is all these other kind of terms here related, related to the buoyant water and then maybe even the buoyant co solvent. But in the majority of setups that you know we're looking at, um, we can basically ignore these these other components here, um, and you know the densities that we're using in terms of buffers is, is close to water. So essentially, the co-solvents again are, are basically in, invisible. But there is instances which we'll see later on in in the kind of advanced methods um, where these kind of terms are can be very very useful. Okay, so for analyzing data, I mean, you, all the kind of the theory, you know, you, you don't really have to worry about because these are all computer driven um, analysis where you, you just really need to know some of the hydrodynamic parameters which you can, can calculate. Um, so there's Peter Schuck has made said fit and said fat, uh, Boris Delimmer then has got Ultrascan and Dimitri uh, Vespinsov who, who was here um, at the LMB a, a few years ago, then made this program called Ultraspin. And there's other ways to analyze, um, you know, DNDC or SEDNAL. And also uh, Chad Fodigan from uh, Southwestern University of Texas then made GUSI, which is a, a graphing program, but it also can be an analysis program as well, which we'll see later on. So in terms of hydrodynamic parameters, Lots is known as you know great history, and so a program like Seven Turp can actually calculate, um, you know, the, the V bar and also the density and viscosity of of solutions. Um, in the LMB, we've we've actually got a viscometer and a, a densitometer, so we can actually measure them, the samples uh, themselves accurately. Um, for things like calculating frictional coefficient. Um, Jose, uh, Jose Garcia de la Torre has, has made uh, a program where you can hydrodynamic model um, based on the structure using bead modeling, and you can actually then calculate what a frictional uh, coefficient ratio would look like. Right, so let's, let's think about doing experiments. So for an AUC workflow, it would be such that, okay, you're, you need lots of primary information, you know, do you have a, a, a good a good sample purity? You know, do you need to know the amino acid sequence because you need to calculate, um, you know, the, the V bar, etc. You know, you know, is there any mass? Uh, is, is there any modifications? You know, have you done any mass spec? And um, we need to know the composition, comp the composition of the buffer. And if we're, um, you know, doing, uh, you know, especially if we're, if we're doing interference, then we must have this buffer matching this, the sample buffer. So an initial characterization, we might just want to do sedimentation velocity experiment, spin it at quite high speed and do a CNS analysis. You know, is it nice and pure? Can we, can we get a, a good uh, value out? If not, then maybe we need to go back and, and repurify. You know, if it's pure, you know, it, are we kind of looking at interacting components? Well, if we're not, then maybe we can look at mass. Um, and is this frictional coefficient reasonable? Do we do we get a, a you know a nice a nice result? Or maybe then you know if we really want to know what the exact mass is, then we can do some sedimentation equilibrium experiments. You know if there is interaction, then we can look at you know look at changes in distributions. You know, perhaps you might want to label one component, or just uh, you know, change the concentrations. Um, alternatively, we can then look at sedimentation equilibrium to get then binding constant side. So in a velocity experiment, you know, we're going to load multiple concentrations, perhaps, you know, for absorbance, and we're going to keep within these kind of bounds um, for, for a uh, interacting series. Then we're going to do a series of, of titrations, perhaps, you know, changing, you know, both uh, one of the components. The, the terms of the volumes you actually need then for 
the, the kind of standard 12 millimeter cell, we need about 400 microliters of both buffer and then sample. If we're doing fluorescence detection, then we need about 80 microliters. For absorbance and detection, then we can use you know, multiple wavelengths, you know, maybe 280 and interference, or you know, we're doing fluorescence detection system, then we can only really just look um, at the fluorescence detection. We tend to then just do a, span, a standard high speed spin at 50,000, you know, four components then up to about one megadolphin. You know, if, if, if they're larger than that, then we can lower the speed down. Um, and then we'll just fit the data, which we'll see later. For equilibrium experiments, then, you know, normally I would use a, a six cell um, or six sector cell, um, and that just takes 100. And, 10 microliters per channel. And, you know, for, you, again, you're gonna use, you know, different concentrations and to get a good span, if you're looking at an interacting system, you know, above and below uh, the KD, so you can populate all the, different, all the different species. You know, typically we'll do just, you know, free, free, free speeds here. You know, a low one for, for high mass, um, a high speed then for the depletion of the meniscus. This is this, this, this one down here at the bottom, and then an intermediate one. So typically we'd, we'd do 12 scans, you know, with eight hours or more between scans, and then look to make sure that we've got um, an equilibrium, there's no further movement at that speed before you then move on to the next speed. And we can fit the data to get us you know, ideas about self association, masses, and equilibrium. So again, very important to match the buffer to the sample and for interference um, for absorbance then you know keep um, the, the buffer components you know down in, in, in absorbance you know if you've got nucleotides then you know use interference um, I, I, ionic strength is quite important you know you need to have some counter ions in there um, you know, maybe be able to go down to 10 millimolar but um, you know 120 to 200 is, is best Density, again, near water, again, so you can just avoid any of those extra terms in terms of the, of the V-bar. Um, and of course, things like glycerol, you know, if you add that in, you might you know, make density gradients. Careful again against components. If you've got something like DTT, if you were doing, say, a sedimentation equilibrium experiment, you know, over a week or even overnight, you know, that will oxidize and that, could, that will change absorbance properties. Um, so you want to avoid that. With fluorescence, then yeah, again, you know, we need something that's going to fluoresce uh, with excitation at 488, so GFP or fluorescein. Um, but an advantage of that, you know, if you, if you, the, the actual medium, you can actually look at even serum or cell lysate. Um, but it's important also to, you know, know how much uh, labeling you've got if you're looking at an interacting system. So you can actually relate uh, the fluorescence then back to the total concentration. And it's important then to remove the free dye because you'll be able to see that in the sedimentation. And if you're looking at a, an interacting system, you know, make sure that labeling one of the components then isn't, isn't then going to affect that binding, perhaps not specifically by the, the partner then binding the, the dye. So let's let's look at some examples here. So the first one here is is uh, a sedimentation velocity experiment using absorbance, and this is the kind of the data you, you're going to look at. So absorbance is here on the y-axis, and these uh, here's the meniscus. Here's the bottom of the cell, and then all these different colors then are the different scans um, going in rainbow colors. Then you know going from blue all the way to to red here. And this is from the start then to the, to the finish. And this is in, uh, put into the program called SEDFIT. And in this uh, CS analysis, it will ask you for all these kind of different um, hydrodynamic parameters. Here's the partial sort of volume, um, put in the buffer density and the, the viscosity. And we can you know, account for kind of any kind of noise here um, by using, by clicking on here. Um, then we can float the parameter here for the meniscus. And this is a regulation, regularization component here. We set this at, at 0.86. And the question we wanted to answer here was, is alpha synuclein then recombinantly made in, in bacteria? Is that 
unfolded monomer or is it a tetramer? A few years ago, there had been some controversy um, in the fact that a group had purified alpha synuclein from cells and found that it, that it was tetrameric and there wasn't anything else bound in there. And so we wanted, wanted to, to test that out with our recombinant material. So again, this is fitting the data and the black lines are the fit to the data. And as you can see here in our battery, you can kind of see here's the blues, the early ones down to the red is, is the late scans. And so the errors um, you can see here in this error bitmap were uh, on the vertical axis here is, is all the different scans here. And so we're going across then the radius and black or white dots will actually mean um, the data is not fitting to the, to the, uh, to the fit. Um, and as you can see here, it's mostly gray. So it's all fitting very, very well. And this is basically collapses into the residuals here. And you can see there is no systematic error. So what we got was a, a single uh, sedimentation, sedimentating uh, component here um, with a sedimentation of 1.2. And it had a very, very high frictional coefficient. Um, so that then the mass came out as just a monomer. And so this, this high frictional coefficient may, meant that it really sedimented um, a lot slower than ex expected for its mass. And if you imagine again, going back to the crowded room, if you kind of were, were going across the dance floor or were going to the front of the gig and you had your arms out, then you're going to be you know, bigger size and it's gonna be a slower time for you to move through that room. So here's um, an example of interference detection from uh, where it's a project with Flory Passmore. And they had solved uh, this structure here. Um, and it was, you know, a question of whether it was a tetramer or a dodecamer because um, another group had, had previously published um, a structure with a, with a different um, number of, of subunits. So again, uh, the sedimentation looks a bit noisy here and there's a lot of jitter where the, sc the scans are kind of moving up, up and down. Um, and, but we can actually use time invariant uh, correction then to correct that and then and fit. And so we could find that the majority of, of uh, the protein here was in a tetrameric uh, form and there, so that the crystal structure was correct and there wasn't really any higher species. So with sedimentation velocity, we can tell a bit about um, the kinetics of, of interacting systems. So that if say, you know, is there an interconversion during the run of sedimentation, um, you know, that will, that will how, you know, what the rate of interconversion Will then will then um, affect what you see um, in in the analysis. So if if say the interconversion for a very slow, you know less than you know ten to the minus four per second, then you can see separate species. But if there is you know the, the, the association between the, the components is, is relatively fast, then what you'll see is an average of of species then um, which are you know, then moving, you know, with concentration. And this, this is analogous to what Jane was talking about in the NMR, where, you know, you, you get an average, an average peak. But we can still use this kind of data to look at um, interactions, and that's by, by doing a weight averaged um, S value here. And this is an example then with uh, David Ron's group over in CMIR. And what they were looking at then was this enzyme FICD, which is either an amylase or deamylase, depending upon um, whether it's a monomer or dimer, and it's in the ER, and it amylase is um, amylase then BIP, and which changes um, its its um, status. And so when we when we sedimented uh, this uh, using the fluorescence detection system, um, lots of different concentrations, what we could see is that as the concentration increased, then we, we, we got a shift in, in a peak. And, that, um, and so these you know, were intermediate between one of them and a dimer. 
So if we just integrate and said fit, we integrated um, all the way across. We got a, a weight averaged S value. And then with concentration, we could actually fit that to then get what the dimerization constant was. If you mutate um, in this dimer interface, then you know, the sedimentation coefficient didn't change at all. And here's an example of, of very slow kinetics uh, with uh, Paul Elliott, who's now in, he's got his own group in, in Oxford. And he was interested then in this uh, system here, where uh, this protein, uh, uh, silo D, then bound onto spatter 2. And it was all important in terms of ubiquitination and deubiquitination and signaling. Um, so when we sedimented, we could see that there was individual components here. Here's spot of two, and here's side of D. And then when you add them together, you get a complex here. And there's not really any shift in this complex uh, sedimentation mm -hmm. when you uh, change the concentration. So typical kind of experiments that we're, we're kind of asked to do, you know, would be, you know, does my protein self-associate, you know, or do my two components self-associate, you know, what is in my sample, what is the range of sample, you know, species are in there, you know, what's the stoichiometry of my uh, sample, you know, is my binding very strong, is it weak, um, you, know, you know, if I have a multi-component system, you know, what binds to what. So here's, here's a question uh, from uh, Jan Lowe's group, which was, you know, is my, is my complex fully, fully formed? So they had this arcade and dimer. And in the sec miles, what we could see was that there is a range of, of components here and range of sizes. So it looks like it was organizing. And but the highest concentration, you know, you know is, it, is it really forming a heptamer or an octamer? We're not really quite, quite sure. It's very difficult to assess. Um, to be able to then populate uh, this again, probably because of the dilution during uh, the size exclusion chromatography. So I put it into the AEC velocity experiment and did this thing called hybrid uh, continuous analysis. Because obviously you know what the mass is of, of the subunit. So you can ask, you know, well, how many um, subunits are you know, forming the sedimentation species? So at high concentration, we could see there was an octamer, and when, when you then diluted this, the sample down, then this octamer then fell apart I mean, to its different, different components. And again, to make sure that this was actually correct, and we could, uh, I'll show you later on, we, we went and did uh, an equilibrium experiment. So you can look at very, very tight binding complexes, and this is uh, from uh, Ingo's group in the Allen B. Um, were there, and again, looking at the glutamate uh, receptor, and it forms, you know, lots of homotrimers and heterotrimers. And to be able to get a handle on, on that, then what they, they did was label uh, one of the, the subunits. And then you can see the sedimentation profile here, then you, you get a mixture of monomers and dimers. And so if you then, you know, label uh, one component and then mix it with an unlabeled component and change this concentration, then you can see a whole change in the distribution. And you can fit uh, the concentration of species by fitting the Gaussians, calculate the areas, change that into concentration because you know how much you put in, and then calculate the KD. Another thing you can do is, is mechanistic studies and you can ask, you know, were, you know, what binds to what? In this case, then this was a collaboration then with the bicycle therapeutics when uh, part of their group was, was originally in the LMB. And they uh, make these bicycle, uh, you know, stapled peptides. And they were looking at this target, which is TNF alpha, alpha, which is a trimer. And so we could see that, you know, the TNF alpha, well, actually it looks as if when in the centrifuge, uh, it's when you've got two components here, it's either got a monomer or a, or a trimer. But then when, when they put in uh, the bicycle, uh, what, what we could then see was that we could see that there was another component here, 
um, which was intermediate between the trimer and the, and the monomer and the sort of dimer. So the question was, you know, well, where does this bicycle peptide bind? Does it bind to the trimer and associate it, or perhaps it, it binds on to a dimer, or it binds onto the monomer and then just shifts the entire equilibrium across? So we could do this in the fluorescence detection system, first of all, by labeling the uh, TNF alpha. And by doing that, then we could actually start to see then that there was um, a small bit of, of dimer here amongst the, the, the monomer and the trimer. And then when you just label then the bicycle uh, peptide, and then you only see then the free bicycle and also then one species here that, that is then sedimenting a, with a coefficient of about two. And then that corresponds um, to the dimer of TNF alpha. And then when they saw the structure of the complex, they find then that the, the bicycle was, actually, was indeed actually binding um, within the interface between the two, uh, two monomers. Okay, so here's a bit more, a bit more advanced, and we'll, we'll kind of come back to those um, other hydrodynamic parameters. Um, so to be able to look at glycoproteins, what we can do um, in this in the work that was originally done by Quanadol um, was we can exploit the difference between the uh, the phi bar, the partial specific volume between a protein and a, an oligosaccharide, um, and look at its diffusional properties, and they, they did this by, by really seeing that there was, not, there was an opposing trend between the observed and the theoretical mass. So in terms of getting this then at a degree of, of carboxylation, and that's gonna then depend upon, and here you can see this is the, um, derived from the S value here, the diffusion is glycoprotein, the mass of, of the protein um, and sedimentation is glycoprotein. And then this is going to be dependent upon the difference then in the phi bar between the carbohydrate and the protein. So you would then centrifuge um, lots of different concentrations then of your glycoprotein. And this is in the green then would be your observed, observed mass. And then this black line here in is what uh, the theoretical mass should be. And then at the interface here where the, the crossover, then this will give you the degree of carboxylation and the mass of the, of the protein. And looking at membrane proteins, now the, the, traditionally this was a quite a very, very difficult um, area to be able to look at because again, you've got, you've got the detergent component. And so what people had to do would be to do density matching so that uh, of the buffer such that the the, main, the detergent component or the lipid component then would, would disappear in the sedimentation coefficient because you've density matched the solvent. Um, Christina Bell's group, um, they've just gone, well, let's, let's treat the, the detergent or the lipid as, as, a, as just a component um, with, within the sedimentation. Um, so again, we have to then invoke, then there is ex expansion of the uh, the observed uh, partial specific uh, volume, and then that is component of the protein component, and then also of the detergent component as well. And so again, you know, here we go. Here's here's the detergent, and here's your membrane protein here. And so they again, you sediment lots of different concentrations of your membrane components. And again, looking at uh, interference and absorbance to be able to then get a value for, for this uh, delta D, which is, is then really re related to then, uh, you know, to the changes in concentration and refractive index. So if we know then, you know, what this component is, we can, can then look at uh, the, the kind of the mass of the, of, the, of the membrane protein um, by, either, by kind of doing either you know, plausibility of what the frictional coefficient could be or calculating the, the, the mass of the protein from the, the sedimentation coefficient of what the, the diffusion is going to be. 
uh, or calculating the mass of protein then from the sedimentation and what the Stokes radius should be. So what it can do then, again, here's the, uh, in GUSI, it is, is then, you know, you're putting in um, the components of the hydronomic parameters and you're looking at the observed uh, mass in green here and you're, you're then looking really, you know, where you, you think kind of uh, the monomer should be in terms of the, the protein. Um, and then you can look at the plausibility of, of that if it was just a, a monomer or a, a, a dimer or a trimer. In this case here, um, you know, the, the plausibility here would be uh, for a monomer. In that case, then, you know, if you, if you know then what the mass of the protein is, then you could actually work out what the, uh, the amount of bound lipid or, or detergent is. Right, so for equilibrium analysis, then we're just looking at mass, we're looking at, um, you know, three uh, different, spe three different uh, speeds and then different concentrations. So let's, let's come back to um, our, our Caden, where we, you know, was it actually forming a, you know, um, an octopus or not. So it's a dilution series, centrifuged, and then the mass all came out um, at 116 um, kilodaltons, and that was very, very close then to what was expected for the um, anoctomeric species. And here's another study then done with, with Mark van Bruegel, and he was looking at the centriole proteins, and it's it solved then uh, the structure, and so, and it came out as a dimer. So the question is, is that just a crystal artifact or is this actually real? Well, if you looked at what the apparent molecular weight was against protein concentration, then you can see it, it increased um, with protein concentration. Well, if you made a mutation in this, in this uh, dimer interface, then you can see that destroyed um, any kind of increase. So therefore that looks like that's definitely dimerizing. So we not only kind of look at, say, you know, that's something singly, uh, you know, one protein, or you can also look at interactions. So, you know, this is a simple exponential. So is it just one component? You know, is it a single? And, or maybe it's, it's a double um, exponential. So there's two species kind of going in there. Um, we can exploit that then in this case here um, by then uh, looking at, you know, what what fraction of of the observed um, profile is then due to you know a monomer and the dimer by by doing that kind of calculation then fitting then you can then work out what the binding constant is but of course you need to have you know enough concentration here so that you're going to populate the individual species and the dimer as well so that's why we do also different concentrations Here's an application then again from Mark van Bruegel. Um, and again, he was looking at another uh, component then looking at, the, the, at dimerization. And we could see then that the wild type, we could, you know, form a very, we could form a dimer and it's very quite weak. Um, and if you mutated here in this interface, then you got a much lower mass because it was essentially monomeric. You know, you can go beyond um, just simple, you know, one-to-one -one kind of binding and in like a program like SEDFAT, there's lots of different models you can actually make in terms of, um, you know, you know, you know tri-components here and, you know, different, different schemes as well. And of course, you, uh, to kind of get a handle on, on, on all of these and what you can do is you can actually exploit the fact that, that these data programs can, can then fit globally with, with different signals, you know, from interference and from absorbance. And here's, here is a example of that. So we've got, uh, you know, we're going to measure this by absorbance. We can basically see everything, but if we just did by interference, then, you know, we will, um, sorry, if we, if we did this by absorbance and we're just kind of, you know, then going to look at the labels uh, component here, then we can see the, the group of it to then deconvolve and see where the free component is and uh, what the bound material is here. Um, and again, if we then looked at interference, then what we would just see would, would, would be then 
um, the other component here and the free component. So then, you know, from deconvolving that, we can then work out what the KD is in the different concentrations. Right, so here's an example of, of you know, recent publications we've used. It's been very, very useful in, in different, lots of different projects. And there's a lot of, you know, it's got a big history. There's a lot of literature out there. You know, Beckman supplies, um, you know, books, and there's you know, obviously uh, lots of nice books as well to read. Um, there's a you know, big community out there. So, you know, there's websites to be able to look um, at the software or for different, different uh, groups. And for people who are you know, internal to the LMB, then you can have a look at the LMB website. So, so I'll leave it there for today. So if you've got any questions, um, please type them into the, the Q&A and I will, I'll try and answer them. Okay, that looks like there's, there's no questions being typed into the, the Q&A. So, you know, thanks for your attention. Thanks for sticking with us. And, you know, don't forget to join us again on Thursday when it's going to be a double header between me and Chris. And we're going to probably talk about maybe the most important talk during the school series, which is, you know, error analysis and you know, how, to, how to fit data. So please tune in then. Um, bring your friends. <laughs>